Father, thank you for your word and for the blessing of your son, Jesus, who is your word incarnate. Come among us in body and in blood. Open our eyes to see spiritual things and our hearts to understand and to obey. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Every Sunday we read from the Word and make great ceremony about bringing the Word in, standing as we ought, and apologies for forgetting to remind us about that. But what is this thing all about? Ought it not be for us, as it says in our Constitution, that it should be our only rule of life and faith? Psalm 119, which was just read to you, is the longest chapter in the Bible, and it is entirely dedicated to the importance of God's Word and seeking out God's precepts, God's law, God's commandments. There's several different words that the writer uses it to describe what we know as the Bible. So it ought to have some claim on our lives. In fact, it ought to have a primary claim on our life as our singular rule of faith and life. So with that foundation, I want to remind you of what I talked about last week, the story of the Good Samaritan. And you and I have, have been raised uh, believing that there was one interpretation of that, that we should follow Jesus' admonition to go and do likewise. In other words, we are to reach out with our largesse and our gifts to help those who are in need. And many, many countless good works have been done following that very simple guidance. Who is my neighbor? Whoever is in need. And the Good Samaritan demonstrated for us the sacrifice that we are called to make as individuals on behalf of others, especially those who are in need. But there's another way of thinking about that when you step back and you think about what who was this Samaritan? And as I discussed last week, a Samaritan was a despised member of society. They were looked upon by Jews, who were the majority, they were looked upon as religious and ethnic half-breeds, that they were despised and rejected. And for Jesus to have made a Samaritan the central character of that parable would have been utterly shocking to the people of that day. They would have gasped, literally, <gasps> when they heard him say a Samaritan came along. They would have expected the worst from the Samaritan instead of the best. And so as we read that story, we ought to stop and think, well, which one am I actually like in the story? And most of us, most of the time, could not say that we're like the Samaritan. Most of us, most of the time, could not say that I am a member of a despised and rejected margin of society. Most of us could say that, well, I am privileged, that I have been educated, that I have come from a reasonably stable and functional family, that I have food for today and for tomorrow that I have money that I am privileged to spend on leisure, that I am reasonably affluent, maybe not the richest person on the block, but by the world's standards, if we have bread for today and bread for tomorrow, we are affluent. If we have the option of choosing the red jumper or the green jumper, we are affluent if we have the privilege of planning next year's holiday, then we are affluent. You see, the vast majority of the world simply does not have these options at their disposal. And those of us who do, thanks be to God, have privilege that we are not like the Samaritans, that we are more like Jesus' listeners, who were the Jews who happened to be in the majority at that point. So when you take those cultural factors into mind, it gives us pause for consideration that maybe we're not actually like the Good Samaritan. 
strive as we might do to reach out to, to, uh, to provide for the needs of those who have less. And a minority reading of that text would suggest that we're more perhaps like the priests and the Levites who walk on by the needy. We're more like the robbers who greedily and rapaciously exploit other nations for our own gain. Where did all the wealth in Britain and Europe and America come from but from other nations? That spiritually, in many respects, we're actually more like the fellow who was beaten and stripped and left for dead. As John said in the book of Revelations in chapter 3 to the church in Laodicea, who was also a prosperous, relatively affluent community, he says, you think you're rich and you have all these things, but you don't realize that you're wretched and pitiable and poor and blind and naked. In other words, the material life that you have has created a spiritual blindness that we cannot discern what is actually most important, which is why we do well to listen to the words of Psalm 119, which is all about remembering and thinking about what is actually in the Word. That's, that's where we put on glasses to see the world more clearly, is through the lens of God's Holy Word. Now, Paul carries on Jesus' theme uh, when he says in Romans chapter 13 and verse 8, he says something very interesting. He says, oh, no one to any, no, oh, nothing to anyone except the continuing debt to love one another. Oh, nothing to anyone except the continuing debt to love one another. Now, again, when we think of loving other people, our inclination, my inclination, is to think that I'm to love people from my position of advantage, that I have more, therefore I share, that what God has given me spills over for the sake of those who have less. It is a greater giving to a lesser. But following also the example of Jesus who turns the social order on its head Paul is saying, owe oh, nothing to anyone except the continuing debt to love one another. In other words, we're supposed to love people not out of our wealth, but rather out of our poverty. That we are to go on loving because we're paying a debt. Not from our privilege, but from our poverty, from our deprivation that we are perpetually paying off a debt of love, which is clearly the love that God has poured out to us lavishly in the person of Jesus, which is then supposed to spill over. But we have a debt to other people. It's like Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Or, or as Luke writes it, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, because they will be satisfied. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. In other words, he's turning everything upside down. It's not blessed are those who have a lot of stuff, and uh, they're going to be happy with that. It's blessed are those who don't have a lot of stuff, because God is going to fill them up. We work from a position of debt and underprivilege, loving with those who perhaps have more. Now, this is such a difficult thing for us to understand because historically, as a church that's filled with relatively affluent people, as a church that's filled with people who are well, by the world standard, relatively righteous. I mean, you're here this morning, you're trying your best to follow God. It's our inclination to think that we give from our excess to those who have less. We see lack when we see poverty or when we see addiction or when we see deprivation. But Jesus is turning things upside down. Now, the things that we do in the name of Christian charity are extremely valuable. And as I said, many thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of good works have been done for the sake of those in need. Your own long service 
uh, with the drop-in center and with uh, various missionary endeavors here in the community and around the world are works to be lauded and remembered and will be rewarded. But is there more to think about than just giving of our extra to those who have less? One of the five marks of mission that have become almost as holy as Holy Scripture itself, the fourth one is this, to seek to transform unjust structures of society, to challenge violence of every kind, and pursue peace and reconciliation. To seek to transform unjust structures of society. Now, take the drop-in center as an example. We fed thousands and thousands of people and prepared thousands and thousands of meals over several decades, and yet people are still hungry. The need is endless. Many of you have donated of your excess clothing or your excess finances, and yet the need never seems to be satisfied. One could look at the benefit system in Britain and ask themselves, well, we've, we've, we've done everything we possibly can to provide for the needs of the poor, and yet they're still poor. What is going on? This is where we need to stop and ponder this to transform unjust structures of society. This is where we ask ourselves or ought to ask ourselves, well, we've done everything we can to feed the hungry, but why are they still hungry? Why are some members of our society suffering from lack? What's going on in the economic system that almost guarantees that some people will be poor and will stay poor? What's going on, for example, with these energy companies who rake in literally billions in profit? This is, this, is, this is net. This is free money. And yet millions and millions of people across this country are being impoverished by these extortionate energy bills. Whose pockets are we lining? And why is the government not able, or perhaps is not willing, to stand up to these energy companies and say, enough, enough? Why do we have an economic system that almost guarantees and perpetuates poverty rather than one that is more just and more fair and enables everyone to have a reasonable slice of the pie. That's what it means to sit back and ponder not only the immediate needs of those who are impoverished, but to ask the question, why are they that way in the first place? And what unjust structures do we need to look at from our vantage point in life and think we need to do something about that? Now, Anne Morrissey, in her book, several books, but one in particular, one called Beyond the Good Samaritan, which is along the same lines as I've been talking about, that there's something more that we ought to do. That those of us who are in a position of relative affluence compared to others in society ought to reach out with what she calls venturesome love. Venturesome love. Now, it's well and good to sit at uh, our desk and to write a check uh, or to make a few clicks on our bank account, online banking, and make gifts to those who are in need. But there's something um, almost surgical about that. There's a, there's, a, there's a gap that remains between us and them, that we never know the names or the faces of those who are on the receiving end of these gifts. And what Morrissey is arguing, and I think it's very compelling, it's very convicting for me, is that we're to go out and learn names and learn faces and share fellowship with people who we typically think of as charity cases. Venturesome love, that our discipleship as Christians is not just about attending worship and praying and faithfully giving and, 
and uh, reading the Bible, all those, all those things are important, but they are really effectively internal disciplines. But there's an external discipline that calls us outwards, that calls us out literally, bodily, out of the comforts of our own home and into the presence of those who have less, of those who we typically think of as having nothing. Now, I love hearing the stories that you all have told over the years about the drop-in center, and um, I think there's been moments where there's been a little window that's opened up because you all tell stories about the people that you met there. And I'm not sure if you, you realized, but it's those connections with the people that were actually the most important thing that was happening in those encounters because that's where there was a heart-to-heart -heart moment. There's lots of funny stories and lots of sad stories that happen, but it's not about the food. The food is the means to a higher end, which is a human connection, one person to another. It's sitting down together. It's actually perhaps doing something really bold and sitting down at the table and eating with one of these people who are in need. Those are the transforming moments. I mean, you can feed a person day and night and they'll still be hungry, but what are they really hungering for? Perhaps it's someone who just looks at them in the face and says, how are you? Or what's your name? My name is Tommy or my name is Margaret. It's nice to meet you with no strings attached, with no sense of moral superiority, with no sense of I'm giving out of my largesse because you're a case of pity or charity, but rather just person-to-person -person connection. That's venturesome love because it's scary to sit down with these weird people, right? And actually have a conversation. And that's just, that's just one example among many. Venturesome love. You might call it stepping out of our comfort zone. Because as Morrissey and others argue, and I'll talk about this in, in later weeks, that's where Christ is. That Christ himself is on the margins. That all through the scriptures you see God's, what some scholars call the, the God's preferential option for the poor. In other words, God is with the poor and the suffering. That's what, that's what whole, all of Jesus' life was about, about reaching out to those who are on the margins and bringing them closer to the center. So if we want to follow Christ, and how many of you want to follow Christ? To be obedient, to, to go where Jesus is, not expecting Jesus to come to us, but rather us to come to Jesus. And Morrissey argues very compelling, but very simply, very accessibly, that if we want to grow in our faith, that we need to go where Jesus is. Literally, bod bodily, not figuratively, not writing checks, those things are important, but rather actually going to be with people who are different from ourselves. That's venturesome love. And we go not because we have more, and they have less, but rather because we have a debt, a debt of love that we are paying. A debt that can never be fully repaid because it's a gift that comes from God who has infinite resources, and we can only hold tiny bits of it. So we owe this love to others. And most importantly, we owe it to those who may not know it to begin with. <clears throat> and it's our job to be Christ present to them. And also, and this is most important, to find Christ in them. For Christ is there in their midst. So I'd like you to think about that. What is your debt of love? And it is a debt that we repay. Paul Paul says, and I'll just, just wrap this up, what, what, how is the law summed up? How is the word of God, 
made real. It is in loving one another. And go thou and do likewise. Amen.